right, guys, welcome to the show. It's Tapping with TT, and I have two special guests today tapping in with me to discuss everything that's going on with Diddy's case. I have Kim Osario, former source editor in chief, and also my um, co host with our new podcast, Trigger Warning. Hey, TT. She's been a journalist for over 20 years covering these stories, and of course, Emmy Award winning <laughs> journalist. Thank you. Fox New York, Lisa Evers is here today. And Lisa, I know you have been in the courtroom covering this case. So I want to start with you first. Let's talk about the indictment in detail and the facts. And then I want you to update us on the two bond hearings that went down. I want to know what was Puff's demeanor? What did the prosecution argue? And why the judge ultimately decided not to release him on bond. All right, well, oh, T.T. and Kim, great to be on with you. And, of course, let's not forget Hot 97 Street Soldiers every Sunday morning yes. at 7. You know i got to shout out the show. And Fox 5 New York. Um, and we're on the app, too, because a lot of people are like, I don't watch TV like that anymore. You don't have to. It's on your phone. This is 2024. Get with the program. Anyway, <laughs> I, was in court on, I was in court on Monday when, the, when Diddy was arraigned. And I think the first thing that's really the most important thing to understand is that this is just not an, another criminal case. We've seen him. We saw him in the late 90s, early 2000s, beat that gun charge at the Club New York where he was with Jennifer Lopez uh, with Jennifer Lopez and with Shine. This is much more serious. This is something that could basically but change his life. But also the City College incident that took place where eight kids died um, early on in his career when he was a concert promoter. Well, there have been, there've been a lot of incidents. And in fact, when we went through our video archive files at Fox a, a couple of months ago, when after the uh, civil case had been filed by Cassie against him to kind of open the door to all of this and gave credibility to a lot of rumors, quite frankly, that people had been hearing for years, we started going through the news video files of the stories. There have been a lot of other incidents of fights, of this, of, of anger outbursts, that type of thing throughout the years. But let's keep in mind, what what we're we're really talking about here from just a cold, hard, factual basis. He has never been convicted of a serious crime. And so everyone's presumed innocent until proven guilty. But T.T. and Kim, this is a federal RICO sex trafficking case. R. Kelly is not going to get out of jail for more for several decades because he was hit with a very similar case, although the prosecutors and lawyers I've been talking with all week say this is much more serious. Did he, did he got hit with racketeering conspiracy? That's the RICO charge. Sex trafficking, that's using force. That's not just hiring prostitutes or escorts mm -hmm. and, and you know paying them. That's using force to coerce, uh, coerce women into performing sex acts. And one of the things that has been so hard about this case and I think will be really difficult as it goes forward, if it does in fact go to trial, is hearing the evidence. In the court on Monday, they're talking about young girls, some of them underage girls, drugged for days, being abused, sexually abused by multiple men, gang raped. And then when the girls would pass out just from exhaustion and, and injuries and everything else that they'd gone through, they'd give them other drugs to get them back up. And then, and then, you know, use them and abuse them again. So he's got the, the RICO case. Why is that significant? That's significant because with a RICO case, prosecutors, if they can show that there were pre-existing acts before the, the first one in the indictment, which is 2008, anything before 2008, if it's relating to the same type of behavior, criminal behavior engaged in this criminal complaint and in this indictment, they can bring that in, which is exactly what they did with R. Kelly, with the R. Kelly case. They brought in incidents that had happened before but had never been criminally prosecuted. The other thing with the RICO case that's significant, they can for, if, if the, you're found guilty, they can seize your assets. Then he's got sex trafficking, which is not just the, you know, not just the prostitution part. It's using force, physical force, beating, coercion, mm -hmm. um, intimidation. Then he's got transporting uh, prostitution across state lines. The big allegation is that is what many people have already heard from the media, which is basically that he would force his uh, partners, his sex partners, whoever was the girlfriend at the time, but mostly in this case, it sounds like victim number one is Cassie, very similar to what she described in her complaint, force them to engage in sex acts, threesomes, and even more with these paid male sex workers wow. against their will. And so some of the things that they have been saying in court are very, very, uh, they're very shocking, even with some of the most shocking things that we've heard. So what was the evidence that the prosecution laid out 
in the bond hearing because obviously there's more evidence that they will have to present to the um, defense team. Um, you heard his lawyer come out and say there's tons of videos that they need to turn over to his uh, defense team. So, But I want to know what did they put in front of a judge as of right now that made the judge say no bond he's a danger to society well he they first the, the first the first hearing was he was arraigned on a monday on these charges he was read his rights he pleaded not guilty it's the only time he he spoke in court he was wearing a black t-shirt i think it's the first time i've ever seen uh sean diddy combs diddy i've interviewed him here at hot 97 we had exclusive interviews with him on fox 5 without any jewelry cuz you know you're in you're in court he wasn't handcuffed. It didn't appear as if he was shackled. There were two U.S. Marshals that were as closer to him than I am to sitting to, next to Kim right now, and they were they were right there. But the, on the two sides, the the pr the prosecutor side, which wanted to keep him behind bar uh, behind bars without bail, their main argument was that he, if he were free, he would be able to intimidate witnesses. Mm -hmm. He would be able to ch try to get other evidence, change evidence that's already existing. The, the defense side said, wait a minute, there's a lot more to the story than what people understand. So, and, and uh, given what we already know factually about what happened to Cassie, just from that video that we saw, that horrific video that surfaced in May, the pros the defense attorney, uh, Mark Agnifilo, excuse me, <clears throat> Mark Ignifilo said that the, um, he said, well, what you don't know about that video was how it all started. He said it started because uh, victim number one, who, again, we believe is Cassie because of the facts match up to very closely to what was in her civil suit, mm -hmm. that victim number one uh, went through his phone, saw a woman that he was having an affair with with her, um, on the phone. She took the phone while Combs was sleeping naked and allegedly hit him. This is what the uh, Diddy's lawyer is saying. Hit him in the head with the phone and then he woke up enraged. That's why he was wrapped in the sheets. He came out after her and then we all know what happened. He said, and the greater context, he said, this is not to justify the horrific scenes that we all saw in the video and were sickened by and that he later apologized for, that this was part of a bigger pattern of a 10-year relationship that was toxic. Both of them had substance abuse issues. Both of them cheated. Both of them had mm -hmm. a, a w willingly so, engaged in yeah, threesome. So they so try to say that blame the, was a, blame but, the victim. And, right. and in this case, which is which was pretty shocking, because, but again, this is the this is the bail hearing. This is not what he's going to say before a jury if it goes to trial, which would be very very different. So ultimately, the judges and remember they had evidence. We knew when we saw that action movie style raid on in in uh, March of the homes in Los Angeles and Miami for a federal judge to sign off. This is not just somebody's college friend or law mm -hmm. school friend that's sitting on a bench in a local jurisdiction, not to, to, you know, not to diss them or, or diminish their importance of their work, but they're under super strict guidelines for those kind of search warrants. They must have already had intel about what was inside the homes, which in fact, uh, which was, was revealed also um, this week, two AR-15s in the Miami home, an AR-15 in the famous, you know, thousand bo bottles of baby oil mm -hmm. um, and personal lubricants that were found in the uh, Los Angeles home. It might have been 10,000, but many, many right. more than what anybody right. would need under normal circumstances, even in a large, right. a, a large family. But um, anyway, so the, the they have a lot of evidence. They have this hundreds of terabytes of digital evidence from phone messages. What is terabytes? Just break terabytes that down. Terabytes are like I, I'm not a tech. I'm not a tech person with it, but it's like terabytes are like the biggest size storage. measurement of di digital storage. You know how your phone goes? Okay, yeah. you reach the limit. This is this is about a million times that. So the Fed sees. Ha, ha, must have got a warrant to seize those right. terabytes. And the feds, keep in mind, Homeland Security investigations, the fe, the federal agents, and I know this for a fact from law enforcement sources and also from what we've seen in court documents, they have the ability, people think, oh, I'm, I'm erasing this off, I'm erasing this off my phone, I'm you know, I'm deleting my pictures, deleting my videos. They have a, they have equipment, sophisticated equipment. They can retrieve those. So whatever was out there, they can, it, it can be retrieved in one way or another, either through metadata, which is what goes out over the signals from uh, cell towers and and Wi-Fi towers or Wi-Fi signals, um, and other ways. So, so the main the main issue that was day one. Then the the main the main issue yesterday was basically that he is a threat 
to this public sa- to public safety that they're concerned he did it again. They're also concerned that he will intimidate witnesses because on the second day, Mark Anifolo said, listen, why not let him be under house arrest on his at, at his mansion on Star Island, you know, just right outside of Miami Beach there, which could, controlled only with people around him or friends or close family that are not involved uh, in this case at all. And the judge said, absolutely not. There's too much evidence. We ha- we have too much evidence, the terabytes of evidence, to say that the the to show how he has intimidated witnesses, that even, in fact, after the horrific Cassie incident wow. that day, he was trying to to lure her back and that this, this was just not acceptable. Wow. So what happens next? He's locked up in Brooklyn. Um, M- MDC. Now, this is Fetty Wap is in there. There have been a lot of famous. Casano- uh, Casanova was in there for a while. It's a horrific, horrific jail. It's called a jail, not a prison, because it's technically a federal detention center. So the people there like him who have not been convicted, who are awaiting trial as mm-hmm. well. But I did stories there a couple years ago because when we had that really, really cold winter, they had they had no heat. I mean, inmates, uh, were uh, detainees were banging, banging on the windows. Banging on windows. Mm-hmm. I remember that, that was, Remember that? Yeah, and were, I remember. And the, they were asking for help because right. the, the facility was so... Bad. It was very inhumane. Right, but everybody ends up there. El Chapo, El, El Chapo's been there. R. Kelly. The you know a lot of people. Jeffrey Epstein. A lot. So it's it's this is this is the place you go if you're in a federal a federal case in Eastern or Southern District here in New York. But the next to answer your question, the next the next step is he. So th- the next step is early October, the beginning of October, first or second week of October. There'll be another hearing. Well, he'll, he'll appear in court where the lawyers, his lawyers, and the prosecutors will start to do this battle over what can be admitted and what can't be admitted. But the um, you know, the, the evidence that the feds have for them in order to take this kind of action was really significant. And and that civil lawsuit, the other thing that was crazy was, I think everybody remembers that day, because it was the week before Thanksgiving, when the this bombshell lawsuit filed by Cassie w- was filed in late November, and people started reading it, and we were just, you know, if you're a woman, you're just, go, you're, you're, you're sickened on a certain level, because you're just like going, this is, I can't even, this is, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. heartbreaking. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's disturbing on so many, it's just on so many levels, and human beings, and, and men too, you know, I'm not just excluding them, but men were sickened by it too, because they're like, how could you do this to, you know, to, to a woman, um, allegedly, because it was a civil case. So that opened the door. That case was only public for less than, t- for I think, 23 hours. And if that had not been public, we may not even be sitting here talking about this today because most of this, most of this indictment, TT, most of what's in here, these counts, it almost follows the the timeline and the description of, of what Cassie's lawsuit. Yeah, there's an yeah. arson charge. What was that about? We all all can guess what that was about. You know, with the kid Cuddy car uh, mysteriously exploding. Um, all, all sorts of things like that. And then the big issue, I think, is going to come down to witnesses. It's like, mm. will they have, you know, yeah. will they have the courage to continue and actually get on that stand? So now I'm assuming that the prosecution is probably subpoenaing, su- sending subpoenas to all of the witnesses that they want to call to trial. Well, they already I learned from uh, law enforcement sources ever since they 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 really began with this, which was sometime late winter, early spring. They've had Monday meetings about the Diddy case. They had the team that was working on it. They'd bring in people because, remember, they're looking at New York. They're looking at L.A. They're looking at Miami. They're also looking at Atlanta about what evidence, you know, what evidence was there and what was not there. So a grand jury, they presented in secret all those months, you know, when mm-hmm. we're all asking ourselves, like, what's going on? What's going on? A grand jury was of registered voters who were called to grand jury, federal grand jury duty, which can come not just from New York, but the Southern District. They can come from the, uh, the, northern, the northern suburbs, too, like Westchester County. They were hearing evidence. So they heard the evidence that the prosecutors were presenting, and then they handed down this indictment. You know, the judge signed off on this indictment of the charges. Of course, prosecutors were presenting the charges that they wanted. They handed down this indictment. So a a grand jury has already heard this um, and passed it down. So what's next is this early October. They'll start the the wrangling back and forth, and then there'll be a couple of dates or whatever. And then at a certain point, his lawyer has said, which many of them do and they later change their mind, his lawyer has said, we plan to go to trial. He's not going to take a plea. Uh, Sean Combs is a fighter. He's beat other cases before. But you haven't beat a case with thousands, thousands of terrible 
terabytes or hundreds of terabytes of evidence with witnesses that are willing to come on the stand in the most, and really for the witnesses in these kind of cases too, it's 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 very humiliating for them to have to describe, you know, and relive the trauma that they went through. Yeah. But um, so that's going to be his decision. But here's what I learned yesterday: is if they go to tr- if they go to trial, he, he, it's it's a, a tremendous gamble because especially with the evidence, even if he gets off light, it may be. You know the 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 sentence is thirty years to life. I was going to ask if he's found you, guilty. If he's found guilty, if he decides to take his chance and go to trial, how much time is he facing? If he's found guilty, he's looking at thirty years. He's looking at thirty years to life. Wow. So they at at the federal sentencing, the judge could yeah. go. You know what? You should not even be out on the streets ever again. He is literally in the fight for his freedom right now. Now, if he takes a plea deal, and here was the other tricky thing that that the lawyers were telling me, uh, the, the, who've done these cases, some of them won and lost these cases. They said the tricky thing is, who is he going to give up? You know, TT, you you and I talked about the Takashi Six Nine case. There was he was yeah. very public about. It. I gave up this one. I talked about yeah. this one. But who is Diddy going to give up to the feds? Who is more valuable than he? I, is. I hate to use that word valuable, but it was more significant, you know, or critical to a case like this besides him. Who would it? Po- who could it possibly be? Or what? network could he possibly give up there there are arrests i get the bulletins from the justice department and from the local the local prosecutors every single day they're arresting people on racketeering smaller players uh gangs subsets of the of, di- of different gangs all of this is happening kim knows this as a as a journalist every single day these are these are happening so who else is he going to give up and then when the, the length of the timeline the other tricky thing for him too this started in 2008 and i think a lot of people that have have followed diddy and back to his puff days and knew him when he was around in New York too is there was a big change once he located to his prime you know made his LA his primary residence he was he was disconnected from a lot of his New York people from his New York friends and uh you know a lot happened but what happened in New York yeah i mean yeah and i also wanted to add because she brought up the 2008 when we opened up this conversation, we were talking about all of these things we've heard over the years throughout the 90s, right? All of the incidents where you've seen cases filed against Diddy, you've heard about champagne bottles and incidents with right. Steve Stout. We know about the Shine uh, Club New York incident. All of these things have happened. So at some point, we know the feds were probably investigating things on their own. But the indictment starts with allegations from 2008. And to me, that speaks volumes for what they have as evidence. Because they may not be able to go back before that right now without the, you know, witness testimony and say, hey, we can prove this. A lot of times you say, oh, you don't go up against the feds, they always win. I don't know what the percentage rate is, but a lot of times, you know, a lot of times they do win guilty, right? Or they take a Um, plea. Right. You take a plea. It is it's sort of like word on the street is like you don't you don't go to trial against the feds. And I think that that was interesting for me to read the indictment and see that. It was all dating back to 2008, these allegations, with all of the things that if you just do a simple search on YouTube, there's yeah, those so are many the, things. That, but, but, Kim, they have to first they have to first establish the RICO. And Got this it. is what the but lawyer I, said, because my, they can't start earlier I, because it's outside the statute of totally limitations. Totally understand that from a legal perspective. But I'm talking about what we know, what we've heard, right, and what they want. And, I, you know, we can talk about the hip-hop cops and how they were watching the hip-hop community back then, right? I'm thinking that they did that because they can prove it. That's what I'm thinking. The well, evidence they say, that they have well, is strong enough that they, so can that they have that. Yes, yeah. and, and and a lot of times, we talked about this in similar cases, a lot of times the feds will let you continue the crimes right. Because they want to build the ongoing case. case. And that's uh, that's what I see here. I'm like, okay, this is a very strong case. The evidence, even, you know, we hear Lisa talk about all of the stuff that we're hearing that they have, right? And the case isn't even at trial. Well, no, yet. and people have been talking people have been talking about, you know, a lot of things that have that happened in the past that they felt should have been ex- investigated right. more thoroughly. Right. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yep. But let, let me let me say this is that the other thing is to Kim, to Kim's point, they have to get the once they get the RICO, it's basically the door is unlocked mm-hmm. to go to these other things if there's similar behavior that they can tie to it. Now, what I also found what I also found interesting in the indictment was that they 
it basically combs, you know, and, and let's let's be let's be honest and give him the credit for what he built in businesses, these these global entertainment, fashion, music, mm -hmm. all of these businesses that he built. He did give a lot of people, uh, particularly men, a, a start in their a start in their careers as executives, you know, and a lot yeah. of them are just like today they're like, oh, and that's not the guy that I know that I worked with who mentored well, me. Well, I said the same thing, you know, I've been around him, I've been to his house, I've been in close proximity of him, I've been to his parties, I've been you know, talking to him on the phone, text messages, I know his children, and I have never experienced or seen that side of him. But I also understand I was never in an intimate relationship right. or in that type of space with him. Behind closed Behind doors. Behind closed doors. That's so I key. feel bamboozled in a way and that's why I go back to say like, you know, what you do in the dark will always come to light. No matter how how you try to spin it, if you don't change the man in the mirror, you're just digging your own grave. Well, exactly. And remember also, too, Kim is bringing up 2008, which I think it's critical because remember remember our phones, we didn't really have cameras on the phones widespread until about 2006. The whole social media explosion was 2005, 2006. So things that happened before then, if they happened today, they would he would never, anybody would never have gotten away what they got, they got away with than the way, they do, the way they do now, especially with the tracking and all that. I mean, some of these criminal cases are basically handed to law enforcement and police lease on a silver platter. But in terms of the in terms of the RICO, it's significant because as Kim was saying, with the 2008, they first they, first they have to establish it's a criminal enterprise. And what's interesting to me is they go into detail about Combs Enterprises, uh, his companies, so that his companies were the vehicle for this criminal activity. So now if they if they get a RICO on this at a certain point in the investigation, even before it goes to trial, they can go back to the judge and they go judge listen, what's called a superseding indictment we found other co-conspirators because this is the other question his name is the only name that's on this i'm like going with, with all his nicknames usually there's there's like five or six people and maybe wow. one of them's famous or 10 people sometimes even more and his name when i saw this because I, I was i was like who else is going to be who named else? on this Absolutely. you know in the i'm sure you were everyone was who like else? who else is going to be named it's just him so i i spoke to my these legal experts that that i trust and are familiar with these federal cases and they said lisa it's a conspiracy so that automatically means there's other people that are going to be involved and if, as soon as they get by the the prosecutors can as soon as they get other evidence they can go to the judge and say listen we have new evidence we have and fresh we want, evidence and, want to go get and this person people. and we need to wow. go pick him or her up we need to we need a or we need a search warrant they, there may be things going on now that that and I, I would guess that there are that we don't know about you know but here's the other thing too the other point that I think is really interesting that came out in court that wasn't widely reported because it was just so much in within like an 18 hour space of time his lawyer said that did he came to New York two weeks before the indictment dropped in order to, as a sign of good faith, in order to uh, show good faith, and that he was, they were under the impression he was going to be able to turn himself in. Instead, they, Homeland Security agents kicked, you know, went into the hotel room in Midtown Manhattan. They took him in handcuffs. That was so that they could get this bail issue started right from the get-go, because if he surrendered, it would have been a different uh, you know, it would have been a different situation with the bail. And then also in court, the prosecutor said that they found in that hotel room a substance that appeared to be pink cocaine. Wow. They have to have it analyzed before they mm. can say it. Um, but it, it, it's just a, so I, I'm sure there's a lot. somebody might have tipped them off to. Well, he, they knew where he was because the lawyer. But I'm saying that he was still engaging in criminal activity as he was about to turn himself I mean, in. where are you, you, you're not calling room service for that at a fancy hotel, at a luxury hotel in Midtown right. Manhattan. Wow. Right. And if that's in fact what it was, I mean, let's, right, we don't know. you know, we don't know. It could have been candy or something like that, but, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot to this. So right now he's looking at, he, he's only got two, two ways forward, either take a plea and work out some kind of deal where he's not going to be behind bars for the rest of his life, or he can take it to trial and take his chances. The other thing, the other issue that's critical too is now that there's no bail, um, MDC is in, 
you think certain places or buildings in, in the city are dead zones for cell service, it's very, very slow. It's in the areas where you're allowed to meet with your lawyer. This is what numerous criminal defense lawyers have told me. So if I'm defending some, if you're a lawyer and you're defending somebody, you're going to have to go through in discovery. The prosecutors will say, "Listen, uh, Mr. Nefalo, Diddy's lawyer, we have this on your client, and they have to turn it over to them to let them let them know. He's got to show it to Diddy and say he hasn't known Diddy as." Well, maybe he has known him his whole life, but he, he hasn't been in this situation no, looking at this evidence before. He has to show Diddy and say, what is this? How do I explain this yeah. to them? How do I defend you when we have you doing what you appear to do and say the, mm. the, the Cassie video? So that's a huge blow to him because he's not only will he well, – they, they did it because they don't want him intimidating people and, and you know making calls and trying to influence the case. But it's also going to really put – it's also going to really tie the hands no matter how much money he has for lawyers or how many lawyers he has. Yeah. I have a question, Lisa. They um – I believe they reported that he was in the shoe. Is that is that true? Like, yes. were they put the, in the protective custody? Yeah. Special or? housing. It's called special housing unit, right. which is what's reported. It's very hard to find out exactly where he is or to confirm where he is. We know he's at MDC in Brooklyn. That's the big federal prison, federal detention center, right on the water. When you're going, you know, you come out of the Brooklyn Battery yep. Tunnel, and uh, you're heading down to South Brooklyn or to Staten Island. But um, it's it's been that place has been. It's just, I mean, there was a congressman that went there when we were doing the stories, Jerry Nadler, to to take a look at it because the, the conditions were so inhumane. And if the, yeah. if it had been another country, there, people would have been, like, outraged about it. But, you know, and we hear reports, too. The other thing, too, I think you have to understand, we hear reports, too, that, um, you know— Oh, anybody can get a phone for a certain price right. at MDC. And pre some of that is street law. Some of it has that happened in the past. Yes, it has. We know for a fact. But the fact, but the real, the reality is, he, this is a man who could have anything he wanted at any time. Had a private jet, which he's trying to sell now, that uh, which was supposed to be a sign of good faith that he wouldn't flee the country. Right. That he can have anything he wants. He's in a cell. He has a you know like a basic bed. There. And he's behind no and he's behind bars. Behind very bars. limited, very limited visiting, very tough, very restricted visiting, even with his own lawyers. Yeah. So on that note, I want to ask, I want to shift to Kim for a second, because you know, some folks are asking the question, what does this do for his legacy? You know, I personally feel like you can mourn the loss of his legacy and what he has contributed to the culture because he has provided so much to our lives in terms of music, it, you know, escaping or what was you doing at that moment when he dropped that song and also understand that if he did commit these crimes and he's found guilty, he should equally be held accountable for his actions. That's how I personally feel. And, you know, I think it's sad when you have been blessed with the things that you've been blessed with and you misuse your opportunity and you have so much to lose. You built a billion dollar empire. You have so much to lose and you didn't change your behaviors. And God gave you grace before, you know, we talked about the thing that happened on the, the party. We talked about the Club New York incident. These were public things that had happened, and you got grace. You were never convicted of those things. So you would think that you would change your behavior, and the people around you would have said, you know what, this is my friend. He has too much to lose. No sex, no drugs, no whatever these addictions or vices are. He has way too much to lose. And, you know, I am sad that his legacy will now be tainted by all of this. And I'm equally sad at the fact that these women had to suffer allegedly on this level of abuse. And it's like, you know, he was two people. He To us, to the culture, he was this but Too behind, many people, TT. Right, and behind closed doors, he he was this. So, somebody else. I, right. Somebody I, else. I think the culture is really divided on this, right? I feel like although we're seeing these very, very serious allegations, if we're 
keeping it real, we can just take a stroll, uh, scroll on our social media timeline and see that there are people who are still defending him. Okay, maybe I don't want to condone what I saw in the video with Cassie, but, you know, and there's a lot of excuses out there. So I feel like we have to take steps within our culture to police ourselves. I keep talking about something called enable culture and being that puff was just so powerful. You know, he had so much money. He gave so many people opportunities. People learned from him. He mentored him. He was one of our hip hop icons. This is something that is a big stain on our community. But we we have to start looking within. We have to police ourselves before we get policed. And this is what's happening, I feel like, within our culture. These are conversations that people don't want to have. They don't want to talk about it when they hear about, you know, or they even see, right? Like, I have been witness to things that I felt like are inappropriate. I know other people have also witnessed that, in addition to even seeing things that they know is wrong. It's illegal. It's just so wrong. Yeah. I feel like, you know, and, and when women do speak up, and not just women, right? I don't want to make it seem like all of the victims are women, but a lot of times when women speak up, we're, we are not supported, right? Um, yes, people were outraged when they saw Cassie's allegations, but there were also people within our culture that said things about her and came at her instead of kind of supporting her and really doing the investigation or even when you're out there reporting on the story, right? Like trying to figure out what's going on or giving her a fair shake. There were a lot of things said about her until that video came out. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until that video came out that everybody was like, oh, that's real. This was real, right. This is real. And that's the problem. Like when people speak out, they're chastised for it. Right. So we have to have do our due diligence when these stories come out and start to pay more attention to ourselves within. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right. We have to start policing ourselves when we engage in these crimes and we do these things. We have to understand not only does it impact the culture, the people that look up to us, but also our family, our children, you know, our grandchildren or, you know, our cousins, our uncles, our nieces, our nephews, you know, and then the victims have to go through years of recovery from that type of abuse. And, right. and, and let me say that, I, don't, I, I also want to say, you know, because we don't know internally if there were people within his camp that were maybe trying to tell him to stop, whether it was, you know, um what may have been happening, right, like behind closed doors, because I'm hearing a lot of quotes from his lawyers about this, you know, was his private life or what a man does. I don't, I, I, I'm i misquoting him, but in a sense, it was like something about what he does consenting in his bedroom. Ad- consenting consenting adults. Adult. But there's a, that's a, diff- it, that's a difference between a right. crime. And I think also too for women, and I, I think for women, and I think also for young girls, and, and, and we've all we've all gone through you know we've all gone through it in one way or another in whatever whatever industries that that we that we've been involved in um, it, is that we our our girls especially our teen our teen girls our preteen girls that are like 10 11 12 years old and the culture that they're in the hypersexualized culture we have to make sure that they understand yes you can look pretty here but there's a, a thing of what's appropriate what's not appropriate they don't understand how other people may be interpreting the way that they look and also they have to understand that they have to be taught nobody has the right to touch nobody has the right to touch you if you don't want to be touched and that there's if something does happen you need to tell you need to tell somebody and you, your parent your guardian whoever it is because a lot of these and the sad thing to me too like the R. Kelly case I'll, I, I harken back to listening to some of some of the the victim the survivors I'll, I would call them that the to some of the survivors it's like there, there's very very bad parental you know a lot of them came from situations where it was almost as if I don't want to say the parents were pimping them but the parents were this was you know they, they were, were using living, the kid l- living yeah. vicariously through their kids right. and, yes. then, and and things that a normal parent would be like are you freaking kidding me you, you need to get away from my daughter right now yeah you know you need to get away from my daughter I'm taking your picture yeah. and if you come back here again uh, on the block or uh, you know whatever whatever it is I'm going to do something about it and I think that's a sad thing and I think the reality the reality too we need to to uh, to understand too and this is the other one other thing interesting about this case the prosecution team is five females 
Wow. So that's going to that's going to play a role in it because you you have five women who came up through law school, came up through a very brut a very rigorous is the word I, I would use, a uh, career track in order to become federal prosecutors and they're going to they're I'm sure they're going to make sure, I'm sure they want to make a statement with this too and make sure that everything is 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 on the dotted line. And TT to your point about about uh, Diddy, his contribution to the culture. I mean, I always remembered it with with one one of the things was he was the first one to wear a suit jacket and like yeah. like cut, look cool in, in mm -hmm. formal clothes. It he made cool in, being an executive in, cool, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And there were and then of course the music and all the things that both of you have have said so far. But I think this case is going to come down to. I mean, this is it's more serious. I've I've asked people about what you know. How does this compare to Weinstein? Because Weinstein keeps getting hit with. Right more cases and he's got a bunch of uh, civil lawsuits and all of this and they said there's a big difference Lisa Weinstein's in these are state cases California's a state case the new one here in New York is a state case he's not he's not dealing with a federal case and it's case by case where the the the, the feds like the Alvin Bragg the Manhattan prosecutor or Eric Gonzalez the Brooklyn prosecutor for them to take a case somebody has to have gone to the police or to his office but most likely the police and, and filed, filed a complaint and, filed, and made a complaint yes. that XYZ they stole my car or they stole my purse or this guy punched me or or whatever it's exactly the opposite with the feds they keep investigating 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 and then when they're ready and they see w what they can do with it then they do something with it and th th this is the result i think a lot of people were like shocked but again this thing this is the thing i would watch who are going to be the other names who's going to be the superseding indictments i'm going to be in court every time and, and uh, we will want you back on this show because I know mm -hmm. you will be in court with your microphone every day. <laughs> on the streets. At, on the streets. Out front of the court. Out, right. out front of the court. You know, Lisa Evers, you are amazing. I've Thank been you, watching you since a young girl and to see all the work that you have put into journali journalism and just being on top and, and sticking to the facts. And, you know, it's such a weird space with media right now everybody just runs with like a lot of things that are just false and mm. you know to have you here breaking down the facts and looking at the evidence and um taking the time out to speak with our audience i really do appreciate that well tt i appreciate the opportunity and in true hip-hop fashion if i can shout out my social yes. media <laughs> yes. handles i mean this is our hot 97 studio and well, plus this is where street soldiers tv was born in this little studio but the um i'm, I'm at lisa evers official you know blue check on twitter on instagram on facebook and lisa evers live on tiktok so please follow me because i post as much um as i can as soon as, as soon as i can as soon as i, I get in a single signal but i would love to let you know leave this this wonderful conversation on a on a very positive note i mean this is we used to do shows in this studio about where are the women artists in hip-hop yeah, right. and now women are dominating in terms of the sales in terms of the yeah. popularity in terms of just the pure mm -hmm. hotness in hip-hop and i think this is is a, it's a time. It's a time now for all all women, really, um, that to to really understand that this is a pivotal moment that we have to look in our own lives and say, could I have been an ally to her in that situation? Mm -hmm. Could if you can't, you don't want to. Nobody wants to pick up nine one one in the middle of something, or whatever. But could I have said to her, hey, listen, you know, you can talk. There's there's special units, and and also too, I work. I work. I have to cover police stories pr uh, quite often. A lot of police departments, not just in here here in New York City, but around the country. Country. And if you're in a small town, your county sheriffs, a lot of them have special special victims departments now where you can at least talk to somebody, you can get support, and you can find out what it is. Because this would have been a very different situation, um, you know, a very different situation if any of these victims previously had filed criminal complaints. Uh, there wouldn't have been so much speculation about, oh, was it consensual? Was it uh, somebody whose career yeah. didn't work out they wanted to and yeah. they're looking mm -hmm. for a paycheck? And, and most of these mm -hmm. places, you can remain anonymous. So yes. if you are experiencing yes. domestic violence um if you are in that situation please don't hesitate to reach out to someone there are um groups out there that will be there to support you and we want to encourage all women 100 to do that yeah and, and just and even to make a even if you don't follow it through with charges or going to court or doing it, any of that which i i can totally understand the fact that you made a police report that individual is now on the radar so you may have saved you may have saved actually saved somebody's life because this the sex abusers and sex of offenders historically they do tend to to grow more violent and more outraged 
outrageous as time goes on if they're left unchecked. Yeah. It's a habitual type of a thing, like with the child molesters. So um, th there's a lot more help out there now than there was in 2008, I'm happy to say, even from five or ten years ago. So you, you can speak to another a woman, a woman uh, professional. It doesn't even have to be a cop. They'll bring in somebody first for you to talk to. And I would encourage it. At least, at least tell somebody that you trust, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, thank you so much, Lisa Evers. Kim Osario, thank you so much Thanks for, for, having for me. coming in and, and being a part of the conversation. And our new episode of Trigger Warning is That's up right. on all streaming platforms, That's wherever right. you get your podcasting. Make sure you check us out and follow um, Kim Osario. Osario Media. Kim Osario Media on YouTube. Please subscribe, like, comment, do all of that. And Kim Osario One on Instagram. All right. All right. All right, everybody. It's Tapping with TT. And thank you so much for tapping into our conversation around Puff, Diddy, Sean Combs. All right. It's Hot 97.